When it comes to human behavior, location matters. Let's imagine a place where children repeatedly play. If we step back from our focus on the cluster of kids, we might realize that located where they play exist swings, slides, and open fields. That is, features of a place here suggestive of a playground that attract children to this location instead of other locations that are absent such entertaining qualities. Features of the landscape are influencing and enabling playful behavior. Crimes also cluster at particular places. I'm not suggesting in any way that these kids are criminals. The analogy is intended to be benign in that respect. But environmental factors can and do influence the seriousness and longevity of crime problems. To study these spatial dynamics of crime, my colleague Les Kennedy and I developed risk terrain modeling in 2009. Risk terrain modeling, or RTM, identifies features of the landscape and identifies how they interact and overlap to create unique behavior settings for crime. RTM is free for anyone to use with tutorials and many other resources posted online. To make it even more accessible, we developed a free software application that automates the technical process. This process of RTM begins by testing a variety of factors that are thought to be geographically related to crime incidents. Valid factors are selected and then weighted when combined to produce a final model that basically paints a picture of places where criminal behavior is statistically most likely to occur. These steps of RTM are applied consistently from one jurisdiction to another. But what's not routine are the way in which these factors come together in different settings or for different types of crime. Let's think about this through the analogy of a kaleidoscope. The cylinder of the kaleidoscope represents the jurisdiction or the study setting that we're interested in examining. The shards of glass within the cylinder represent crime attractors or features of the landscape, such as bars, fast food restaurants, parks, or grocery stores. As we move from environment to environment, it represents a turn of this kaleidoscope so that the pieces come together in different configurations, each representing unique spatial and situational contexts that have implications for behavior at those places. We know that crimes cluster, but there's no standard explanations for these patterns. So it's not safe to assume that a standard response to crime problems will yield similar returns across all environments. Behavior settings differ, so interventions need to be tailored accordingly. Police use RTM to problem solve in this fashion, to develop risk reduction strategies that are tailored to their unique jurisdictions. As an example, at a task force meeting in Jersey City, a conversation quickly centered around gas stations, which was identified as one of the highest risk factors for violent crime, according to the risk train model. Police officers in the room quickly explained how this made sense to them, and explained how they had believed gas stations to be problematic for quite some time. RTM validated and confirmed their experienced gut feelings. But then a community stakeholder added to the conversation. She explained how youth tend to hang out after school around corner grocery stores or bodegas because they have food and drinks and rolling paper that they could use to smoke occasionally at nearby vacant buildings. But these bodegas are required to close at 10 p.m. according to city ordinance. Gas stations with food marts, though, are exempt from this requirement. These 24-7 facilities create unique contexts for youth to congregate, and they provide supplies that they're looking for, which can create unique contexts for turf conflict, offending, and even victimization. Now, the vacant buildings and the grocery store bodegas were also identified as top risk factors. So the Department of Public Works added to the conversation. They proposed prioritizing their existing efforts to board up vacant buildings and to clear vacant lots, but to do so near the corner bodegas and near the gas stations with food marts. Representatives from the Department of Public Work, uh, from the uh, Department of Parks and Recreation, as well as from the mayor's office, proposed enhancing their advertising and recruitment campaigns for summer recreation activities and job training programs. They 
proposed going to the corner store bodegas and the gas stations and other places nearby to engage with youth whom they wanted to recruit into the programs, but do this at places where they spend most of their time. The police department then agreed to deploy directed patrols and meet and greets with managers of risky facilities and to do so at peak time periods. The police officers promised to make referrals to partnering community agencies and social workers when they came across people who might be in need of support, or of support services or outreach. The police department even implemented new protocol to, for crime report writing, which was intended to allow for continued and ongoing risk assessments. As you can see from all of this, RTM allows stakeholders at all levels of the community to prioritize their efforts and to engage in coordinated responses. People like to problem solve, but they need the right information. RTM identifies risky places and empowers police to think outside the box of traditional responses to crime, which are often very person-oriented, such as stops, arrests, or citations. Legal scholars have even endorsed RTM as one of the few, if only, methods of crime analysis that preserves the constitutional protections of the Fourth Amendment and increases objectivity and transparency in policing practices. By now, you're probably wondering if focusing on risky places and not people can really reduce crime. And I'm pleased to say that the answer is absolutely yes, it can. With funding that we receive from the Department of Justice, we conducted experiments in multiple cities across the United States. Policing activities that are focused on high-risk places yielded many benefits, including 35% fewer gun crimes in Newark, 33% fewer motor vehicle thefts in Colorado Springs, and 42% fewer robberies in Glendale, among many other positive outcomes in all the jurisdictions that we studied. Our newest partnership in Atlantic City builds on everything we've learned through rigorous research over the years and puts it into practice with the goal of long-term sustainability. In Atlantic City, we know because of risk-trained modeling why the risky places shown here on the map in red and yellow cover just 2% of the land area but account for 30% of the crime. Police commanders can explain where to go because crime is likely to happen there, but also what to do when they get there, and why they attract criminal behavior. Police officers know what places to focus on, but also what to do when they get there. This is risk-based policing at its finest, and it's needed for public safety in the 21st century. RTM takes the focus off of people and puts it on places that persistently enable illegal behavior. It emphasizes evidence-based decision-making, problem-solving, better utilization of resources, transparency, and sustainability. I know of RTM being used in dozens of cities across the United States and in more than 30 countries across six continents because it's pragmatic. We all live our lives somewhere on the Earth's surface. So policing place-based risks just makes sense and evidence shows that it works. It's also more than just a crime fighter. As a spatial diagnostic method, RTM is used in a variety of other disciplines across many fields, including urban planning, transportation, public health, medicine, environmental science, business, biology, national security, even maritime shipping. This is the impact of being evidence-based, free, effective, accessible, and actionable. And it's what I find so truly fascinating and exciting to be a part of. Thank you for letting me share it with you.